Welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled Scott Madden's Energy Industry Update, Safe by Zero. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. We acknowledge that given the higher demands on internet connection where many are working from home, technical issues may be more pronounced. If for any reason we find the need to restart the event, we invite you to click your same link to rejoin. In such a case, we will also resend those links out. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial into the audio portion using the telephone number listed in the right-hand panel of your interface under the audio section. This event is intended to be interactive with questions from the audience and the moderator. We invite you to submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Now I'm happy to turn the floor over to Kristen Lyons, partner and energy practice leader with Scott Madden to kick things off. Kristen, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you, PJ. It's great to be here and, and welcome to everyone who's joining us. So for those of you who don't know us, Scott Madden is a man management consulting firm that specializes in energy. And can you go to the next slide, please? Our practices include generation, transmission and distribution, grid edge, energy markets, rates and regulation, and enterprise sustainability. We work across the electric and gas industries for a variety of organizations, utilities, including public power, munis, co-ops, ISOs, RTOs, independent transmission companies, independent generation companies, and many others. And as such, we have a front row seat to the dramatic changes happening in the industry today. Which brings me to our webinar. Our topic is saved by zero, question mark. We're seeing an increasing number of organizations that are making these ambitious clean energy uh, aspirations and commitments, yet it's not yet clear how we're gonna get there. So before we, we're saved by zero, we really need to understand the how. And that is some of what we're gonna talk about today. In our most recent energy in industry update, we covered a variety of topics. We've chosen three of those for today's webinar, and I believe each highlight in their own way the challenges of meeting these targets, whether those targets are for 2050 or the more ambitious Biden commitments of 2035. So first, we're gonna spend time on Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap. And in my view, this is an important study because it takes an economy-wide view of what's gonna be needed to decarbonize that state. Second, we're gonna spend time on transmission and its critical role in enabling this clean energy future. Um, many are agreed on the need for transmission to interconnect all of the large scale renewables we'll need. It's not yet clear how that's going to happen. And last but not least, we're gonna hear about fleet electrification and how utilities might wanna think about serving this new class of customer. So as I said, our first topic is the Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap. Next slide, please. Josh Kamich is gonna lead this discussion. He's a director with Scott Madden and has been with the firm since 2014. He spent much of the last few years working in areas such as the integration of DERs, energy efficiency, grid modernization, grid modernization and regulatory reforms. So I'll turn it over to Josh. Thanks very much, Kristen. Hello everybody, good afternoon. Next slide, please. So as Kristen mentioned, we'll be talking a bit about the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization roadmap. And what, what that is, is really Massachusetts uh, in December of 2020, the office, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs released their 2050 decarbonization roadmap. And it's really a pathway or truly multiple pathways for the state to reach its goal of 85% greenhouse gas reduction and overall net zero emissions by 2050. Now, what the document is itself is there's one roadmap that lays out that economy-wide view of you know, ways that the state, the Commonwealth could get there. Um, that, that's backed up by six uh, research reports that get into a lot more detail of different sectors such as buildings, vehicles, energy and generation itself of that build on the roadmap. But what, what's also important is the roadmap itself is building on a history of climate legislation 
and gold in Massachusetts dating back well over a decade. So this is not, you know, say out of nowhere, but maybe the next logical step. And I, I think what's also important to understand about the Massachusetts roadmap and um, for anybody that follows these type of things, I'd say around December or of last year, January of this year, I feel like there was maybe a roadmap or some kind of plan to get to net zero coming out from somewhere every week or so. And I, I think, you know, they're, while they're all important and have important insights, one thing that makes Massachusetts roadmap maybe important or worth watching is that it's more than an academic exercise, but backed up with past work and work in the future in Massachusetts. Part of that is it contributes to the interim clean energy plan and you know, vice versa in the roadmap. Um, and that was also released in December. Uh, there's been public comments uh, in March and should be finalized presumably in the next couple of months that lays out those interim goals between now and 2030, uh, part of that longer goal to get to 2050. You know, part of it is in the interim plan, they, they're at least the draft, they're looking at 45% uh, greenhouse gas reductions by 2030. Now, the, presumably that will be adjusted to 50% in the, in the final version, uh, because at the same time in March as well of this year, Senate Bill 9 was signed into law and the, that law codified the 2050 goals as well that are outlined in the roadmap, as well as interim goals of reaching 50% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030 and 75% by 2040. So it, where, where I think Massachusetts distinguishes itself some is that all these things are working together along with actions from the Department of Public Utilities and regulatory actions to all move forward. Um, the goals, the ambitious, immediately ambitious goals that the state lays out in the roadmap. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little more about what, what that roadmap is and where the state's heading. Um, so I know these, these, there is a whole lot going on in these charts and there's a lot of things to take away, but I find they're helpful because if you look at one thing to understand the roadmap, this, this is really it. And maybe I'll, I'll talk through some of kind of the big things that gets Massachusetts according to the or roadmap anyway, from where they are now to 20, a net zero 2050. And maybe starting with the first graphic and going left to right, you'll see from a energy source, fuel source perspective, dominated by fossil fuels, natural gas generating the vast majority of the electricity and also providing a lot of heating in particular power to buildings through heating and space and water. And then also petroleum products providing a, a little bit of heat to buildings as well, where there's still some, especially residential or uh, industrial or commercial oil uh, furnaces, and then also transportation, as you'd expect, uh, as the vast majority of vehicles or internal combustion engines. And the, the big changes between now that the roadmap takes to 2050, first again, starting on the left, is that generation mix, largely natural gas now, changes to renewables. The biggest portion you'll see there, offshore wind, also a significant amount of solar, mostly utility scale solar, and imports you know, from Quebec, that, that would be uh, hydro and also renewable imports from the region as well. And that, that's looking at electric generation that also makes up a much bigger portion of end use, both for buildings, space, and water heating, and then transportation with the assumption of a fairly high level of electric vehicle adoption. I think the other big thing to, to look at, looking at this these graphics and to understand in the roadmap is they're relatively to scale. So when we talk about from an overall economy-wide BTU perspective, demand as a whole shrinks. And there's a few things happening there. And Buildings and transportation are again by far the biggest sectors. Where on the building side, there is a assumption that there is a significant conversion of building space and water heating from natural gas or a little bit of oil to electric. 
And one of the assumptions in the roadmap is that electric heating, you know, say a gas, natural gas furnace, the conversion to uh, an electric heat pump, that heat pump is about three times as efficient from a BTU perspective. So that's where you get some of the decrease in demand in buildings. They're also built into the roadmap and um, is a fairly ambitious goal in terms of just energy efficiency, building en envelope efficiency. And I say ambitious, not just from the size, but um, if people are familiar with Massachusetts track record and energy efficiency, it's perennially, you know, AC, Triple or whoever ranks Massachusetts number one in their state scorecards. So Massachusetts has already made a whole lot of progress in energy efficiency, but this roadmap lays out a, a lot more to go when we're talking about building efficiency. Now, for electric vehicles, it's some of, some of the same story, or at least similar. There is a definitely assumption of an adoption of electric vehicles, especially light duty passenger vehicles, some medium and heavy, though some still remains on petroleum products or hydrogen, things like that. And then there's also assumption of efficiency here in a couple of ways. First, uh, similar to heat pumps, the assumption that a fully electric powertrain or uh, vehicle will be three times efficient again from a BTU perspective is an internal combustion engine. So there's some efficiency gains in transportation there. There are some assumptions that air travel efficiency gains, um, but also larger adoption of public transit and use of bike lanes and city planning uh, to accommodate those things all are built into some of that efficiency too. And that's maybe just one piece, but a good example of how the roadmap is an economy-wide view. And it's not just, you know, this percentage of vehicles are converted to EVs, but a lot of factors contribute to getting to that end state of 2050. And what we've kind of talked about here is what the roadmap calls the all options approach. And we'll get more into some of the different pathways in a, in a few, in a minute, but that's, kind of, I, I would consider it the middle of the road approach for all these different factors coming together to get to a net zero economy in 2050. And uh, next slide, please. And here we'll look just a little bit deeper on power, energy demand, particularly around electricity and just briefly looking left to right. I think we saw this in the previous, but it's a little starker here that from an energy perspective, here at 2020, the vast majority of sources of energy are carbon-based, either natural gas or petroleum products going to transportation. And as we move from 2020 to 2050, a large portion of that is taken over by electricity as we, we just discussed. But looking at the electric generation by source in particular, it's a, a similar story of decarbonization where natural gas, which makes up a large portion of electric generation today in Massachusetts, is reduced dramatically. There is some increase in imports, mostly from Quebec and a little bit regionally in this all options approach, but the dramatic increase is in solar and wind, particularly offshore wind. And so while demand is decreasing overall, the electric demand is actually increasing. And looking to the far right, there's a few things that make that up. What is probably the traditional electric demand from buildings, residents, which is you know, lights, appliances, plug load. But then the increase in space and water heating from those conversions from natural gas to electricity, and then vehicle charging, the, the electrification of light duty vehicles. So one thing to take away here is because of that electrification, electricity plays a much bigger role in this future for Massachusetts. And next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there are actually a number of pathways and I'll briefly touch on them, but I think there's, when we think about the different pathways that are laid out in the Massachusetts 2050 roadmap, I think it's good to think of them not as distinct options, but rather variations on a theme and really variations on that, as I mentioned, that all options approach that is kind of the middle ground, bringing in renewables, efficiency, electrification, 
And then every pathway is some change to that, whether it's DER cheaper, there's regional coordination is easier, or there's less offshore wind or efficiency. And I think the real value of the pathways is, you know, there, there's an infinite number of scenarios here, but the pathways show if one thing's reduced or another, what's the additional renewable generation needed to offset less efficiency? Or if there's no offshore wind, how many, how much more import is needed? And I think that's the real value of looking at some of these, these different pathways. And finally, I'll add that the 2050 roadmap asserts that from a, at 2050, the annual energy cost for the entire system from, from a reference of doing nothing, 2020, just move it forward 30 years versus these different pathways, they assert it's not all that different, which, you know, is certainly an you know, interesting assumption. And I'll note that we don't have all, we, they haven't released all the background of some of their modeling, but it it is uh, important to understand that a couple things, while the costs are the same, the sources are much different in terms of like all the things we've talked about, the electrification, changes in generation, um, but also it assumes that Massachusetts continues on this path and it's, you can't flip a switch in 2045 and get to these costs. It, it means starting now, conversions of space and water heating or electric vehicles and building towards that 2050. And I think that's an important thing to remember in the roadmap as well. And next slide, please. So in, in terms of takeaways, what, one thing to think about and maybe why to pay attention to Massachusetts and their decarbonization goals and roadmap is it is a coordinated effort. As I said, it's not some academic, it's not necessarily just an academic tabletop exercise to do the math to see how to get there. But what the roadmap is laid out is built or is contributing to interim goals that are being set today between now and 2030. There's legislation to back it up and there's also regulatory action to start, say, for example, uh, proceeding DPU 2080 is asking the gas LDCs to look at how those utilities can contribute to 20, the 2050 goals and also what are the impacts. So it, it, there, time will tell, but even in the near term, I would, one could expect to see actions in Massachusetts based off of this roadmap. Um, also, if there's, if you want to look at the highest level of what does the roadmap entail, it's really three things. You know, there's a lot going on in the economy, a lot of different pieces, but at the end of the day, it's the adoption of a lot of renewables, especially offshore wind, uh, significant electrification of end uses, again, in buildings around heating, space and water heating and transportation, and then efficiency across the board, buildings, transportation, kind of every aspect of the economy. And finally, all these things we've kind of just talked about, and there's a lot of different pieces that come together to 2050, but a whole lot of it has to do with the utilities in the state. And the utilities are gonna play a big role, whether it's accommodating more renewables or DER, or the transmission and distribution infrastructure required to do that, or bring in clean electricity from outside the state or in the region and the importance of that, which Farzee is gonna talk about in just a moment, um, to the end uses and conversion, to electrification, efficiency of buildings, all of this, utilities have traditionally played a role and certainly will going forward. Um, another reason to pay attention to the Commonwealth and their journey between 2030 and, or 2020 and 2050. So with that, Kristen, I think I will turn it back over to you. All right, thanks very much, Josh. So our next topic is transmission and transition. Farzine Tajani is our presenter. She is a manager out of our Atlanta office and she's been with the firm since 2017. Farzine, over to you. Thanks, Kristen. Next slide, please, Anne. So across the United States, uh, we're seeing states and territories, utilities and corporations um, show a growing level of commitment to clean energy goals. Uh, these, these goals can range from 100% renewables, uh, to carbon-free and net-zero goals. 
so far, 18 states and territories have adopted uh, clean energy mandates, uh, some setting goals as early as 2030 and others ranging through 2050. 73 utilities have uh, put forth carbon or em emission reducing goals. And of those 73, 51 have put forth carbon free and net zero goals. Uh, that equates to about 77% of US utilities uh, and 71% of electric customer accounts that uh, are going to be uh, in this carbon or emissions reducing goal. And corporations, corporations have put forth uh, voluntary policies to purchase 100% renewable energy and that obviously increases the demand of renewable generation and while some of these companies have reached their deadlines or their goals others have rapidly approaching deadlines and we are seeing an acceleration of renewable generation in 2021 uh, it's projected that about 80 percent of the new capacity in 2021 will be of solar energy wind energy and battery storage uh, now, typically, transmission is planned locally or regionally, um, and conversely, uh, renewables are often concentrated in regions that don't typically align where the greatest needs are emerging. So to integrate these renewables, which are often far away from love, uh, we're going to require large interconnection transmission to make that happen. And based on current levels of transmission deployment, we may see some delays in these clean energy goals uh, due to the lack of transmission capacity. Next slide, please. Right. So uh, as of 2020, the total US capacity was uh, 1,200 gigawatts, and the biggest contributor was 40% uh, with natural gas. Nuclear and coal follow up at about 20% each, and the last 20% is renewables. Now, renewables is made up of solar, wind, hydro, uh, biomass, and geothermal. Solar uh, contributes about 36 gigawatts of generation capacity. Uh, wind contributes about 104 gigawatts of generation capacity. So putting that together, uh, that makes up about less, just, just under 12% of the total capacity. So if we're uh, looking to meet these clean energy goals, we're gonna need to see a significant increase in renewable generation. Now recently, there have been several studies uh, that have conducted assessment of the renewable needs uh, needed to meet uh, these, these clean energy goals. So the 2035 report uh, put out um, a case for 90% clean electricity by 2035 in the U.S. and um, stated the need for an additional 1,100 gigawatts of wind and solar. The MIT study uh, took a larger swing with 100% clean electricity by 2040 in the U.S and um, suggested 2,300 gigawatts of wind and solar added. And uh, on the more conservative side, the interconnection seam study actually did four case studies ranging from 63% uh, to 95% carbon-free electricity by 2035 for US and for Canada, and uh, gave uh, between 600 to 900 gigawatts of uh, solar and wind energy that would need to be added. Um, so in any of these scenarios, uh, whether conservative or, or big swings, we're seeing a significant amount uh, of renewable generation is needed to be added to the grid and at a pretty rapid pace. And that transmission is going to be needed to accommodate these additions. These studies and analyses from industry groups have highlighted the importance of transmission to this energy transition. And uh, there's an emerging consensus that to achieve these clean energy goals, uh, it might require us to double or even triple the size and scale of today's U.S. transmission system. Next slide, please. All right. um, these studies have also shown uh, the important benefits of a long-haul high-voltage transmission system uh, and its criticality to uh, the integration of renewables. Uh, these, this long-haul high-voltage system has the ability to, um, to reduce variability, to respond to dynamic fluctuations in supply and in demand, uh, and to scale to accommodate um, a surge in the demand from electrification. It can also deliver the lowest marginal cost resource to load. And so you've shown that the benefits of this system uh, outweigh the cost of developing this new transmission. Um, re recently, ESIG put out a policy paper 
and stated, and I quote, no single entity has the responsibility or the authority to direct the building of transmission that serves national policy goals. They also went on to say that uh, while transmission is meeting current incremental needs, the pace needed to facilitate clean, the clean energy transition is lacking. Um, they also stated that a cross-country transmission network is critical to minimize the electric system costs and to maximize uh, its flexibility. And um, there's been a little bit of talk of the possibility of developing a macro grid that connects resources from coast to coast and it's garnered some recent interest. Um, ESIC stated that to have a well-designed macro grid, uh, it requires three components. The first is a national planning authority, uh, and this authority would develop plans to serve uh, the entire nation's needs rather than just regional needs. Two would be identification of renewable energy zones, uh, and this these zones would need to support high levels of solar and wind uh, in concentrated locations with the uh, availability of large-scale transmission and interconnection capacity. And uh, the third is a network of multi-regional transmission, and, and it would need to be integrated to allow for the sharing of renewable resources across the country. To date, none of, none of these three components is moving forward. And while several studies have shown uh, the need for some kind of backbone transmission grid to facilitate the clean energy transition, um, there's no clear path forward yet on how to achieve this goal. FERC 1000 had also come out to address the challenges of inter-regional transmission planning. Um, and this was by requiring uh, the establishment of inter-regional transmission processes. But so far, only a handful of projects have gone through that process. Um, but recently, FERC leadership have shown interest in uh, revisiting the order. Next slide, please. So currently, there's uh, about 160,000 miles of transmission operating in the U.S., and less than 10% of that, so about 14,000 miles, have been deployed since 2013 through 250 projects. Um, we've also seen a significant decline in the number of new miles added to uh, the transmission system in the last four years. Um, if you look at the graph on the left, you'll see a total of about 18,000 miles of transmission that's planned today via about 300 projects. And these projects range from uh, you know, various stages of development. So some of them are just announced while other ones are already under construction. And to give you a little context, 18,000 is also the number of miles that have been canceled since 2013 across uh, almost 200 projects. And the average time those canceled projects spent in the queue was just over six years. It was what, 6 6.1 years. So uh, these you know, transmission cancellations are leading to shortfalls of transmission, which then go on and lead to delays and withdrawals of renewable projects. In the, in the MISO queue alone, developers withdrew, withdrew 278 wind, solar, battery storage, and hybrid solar storage projects and many of these projects were in the advanced stages of the interconnection process. And these 278 projects represented about 35 gigawatts of capacity. And this is not an isolated incident. So uh, recently, LBNL did a study of five ISOs where they could gather the data. And it showed that by the end of 2020, only about 24% of the projects that were in the queue actually reached commercial operations. And uh, those numbers decreased even further for wind and solar. It was between 14 and 19% for wind and solar projects. Um, so we're seeing significant re reductions of, of wind and solar projects. Another reason um, that we're seeing delays and withdrawals of these uh, renewable projects is the high cost of grid upgrades. Uh, so clean energy developers, they have to pay for the cost of the grid upgrades. And some of these costs are just too high for a single project and developer to bear. For example, in MISO West, uh, recent grid upgrade costs have increased the total cost of some projects by over 60%. And as these projects are withdrawn and new projects are added to the queue, the, the 
the regional planners are having to reshuffle the queue and conduct new studies. And uh, currently, the interconnection process is heavily um, participant funded. So every time there's a turn in the queue, uh, this leads to further increased costs uh, in of the of the process and more uncertainty of of the deployment. And then it leads to further delays. Uh, as you can see, um, five uh, five hundred five days. That's how long projects spend in the interconnection process in the MISO timeline. And recently, they uh, revised the process, and they're currently in development of revising the process to reduce that to about three hundred and seventy-three days, so a reduction of one hundred and thirty-two days. But 373 days is still over a year. So projects are expected to spend at least a year in the interconnection process in MISO. Right. Next slide, please. All right. So obviously, with all of these studies putting out that we need to increase the transmission system, uh, that sounds quite daunting. And grid enhancing technologies are a possible option or a possible solution. Um, because they can help increase the capacity of the existing transmission system to accommodate more power flows on existing transmission lines. And while a variety of grid enhancing technologies exist, um, a recent study was conducted to examine the combined effects of three of those technologies and their impact on a targeted region of the SPP, so in Kansas and Oklahoma. And these three are the advanced power flow control, the dynamic line ratings or DLRs and topology optimization. Advanced power flow control, um, it reroutes uh, power from congested lines to uncongested lines. Uh, DLRs, they measure and they expand the real time capacity of transmission lines based on ambient conditions like wind and temperature. And uh, they can also help improve the, the safety of the line. And uh, for topology optimization, it identifies grid recent configurations to reroute um, the, the flows of power around bottlenecks. And together, these technologies can free up interconnection for multiple gigawatts worth of wind and solar projects. So, and, and doing so without um, expensive and time consuming transmission expense, expense, expansions, sorry, and um, overwhelming the existing grid. Um, the study I think went on to say that it could more than double the target region's interconnection capacity. So from around 2.5, 2.6% to about six, about 5.3%, uh, not percent, sorry, 2.6 gigawatts to about 5.3 gigawatts uh, without any grid upgrades. And it also went on to say that the cost of these uh, technologies was about half the co annual production cost in the region. It's also worth noting that grid enhancing technologies are not limited to interregional transmission. And uh, recently, uh, transmission owning utilities have begun looking into assessing the use of grid enhancing technologies, but so far the integration of these has been slow. And perhaps um, incentive policies from FERC or funding from the DOE could help accelerate the adoption of these technologies and incorporate them into the transmission planning process. Next slide, please. All right. So the key takeaways of the transmission's role in energy transition. So first, uh, transmission development is a critical piece, or being recognized at least now, as a critical piece of the clean energy transition. Um, and people are becoming more and more aware of the complementary roles played by clean energy development and new transmission development and expansion. Second is that the current pace and scale of transmission development may be insufficient to build out this long haul high voltage transmission grid, which would be capable of integrating all these uh, additional renewable resources that are coming on. And uh, the third would be that FERC has expressed a willingness to help facilitate transmission development and to support state and federal clean energy agendas, and also to help in clearing the log jam in regional and transmission development. Back to you, Kristen. Thanks very much, Farzine. So last but not least, we're going to talk about fleet electrification. Next slide, please. So Kevin Hernandez is going to lead this discussion. He's a partner in our Raleigh office and has been with the firm since 2012. 
In recent years, he's worked primarily in grid modernization and DER integration with a particular focus on energy storage and EVs. Kevin? Thanks, Kristen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm happy to be with you today to, to talk a little bit about fleet electrification and specifically why I think we might want to start thinking about fleets as our own distinct class of electric customer. To begin, I want to just level set a little bit and talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about fleets. I think too often when we hear the word fleets, we think about large heavy duty trucks. However, all types of vehicles are used in fleets, including light duty passenger vehicles, such as fleets of taxis or police cruisers, as well as heavy duty tractor trailers and crash trucks. Perhaps the most, uh, the, the fastest growing segment of fleets, of particularly commercial electric vehicles, are light and medium duty last mile delivery vehicles, such as vans and box trucks, uh, used by Amazon, UPS, FedEx, among others. Each of these companies has announced major commitments to electrifying the thousands of vehicles in their electric fleets, uh, most within the next 10 years. The point being that fleets are based and operate in almost every single utility service territory, and they come in a variety of, of shapes and sizes. For utilities, it's gonna be very important to have a good understanding of what fleets are in your service territory in order to best tailor your programs and outreach and in, in, uh, to the right organizations. Next slide. So why are we even really talking about fleets in the first place? You know, I think much of the early EV focus in the industry has, has been on customer adoption, residential customer adoption and public charging infrastructure, really to get out that, that question of, of range anxiety among the public. However, it's our view that fleets may likely be the first to electrify, particularly in large numbers. And there are a few reasons for this, but I wanna focus on a couple. The first is the suitability of light medium duty EVs for last mile delivery duty cycles. And when I say duty cycle, what I mean is the operating conditions of a vehicle over its assigned route and task. As I mentioned, last mile delivery and other short and mid distance duty cycles are predictable and they benefit from the ability of fleets of the vehicles to return to a home base each night to charge, which optimizes infrastructure and is really meets the, the, the capabilities of today's current EV vehicles. It's not surprising then that manufacturers are responding to this demand for commercial EVs and a wide range of new EV models, particularly in this medium duty class, are, have recently been introduced. Uh, we, many of you have heard about Rivian and their deal with Amazon to produce 10,000 new electric delivery vehicles. Also, UK-based startup Arrival has a similar deal with UPS. Just over the last couple of weeks, we've heard announcements from both Ford and GM about their electric pickup, uh, pickup trucks, um, which is really gonna drive, in our view, um, additional fleet electrification. Another driving factor um, that's unique to fleets is the sustainability goals that have been adopted by many organizations. Many of the large corporate, um, uh, many large corporations have corporate commitments to electrification, which is driving their interest in EVs, including over two dozen leading utilities around the country. Corporate sustainability goals are really pushing organizations to look at their fleets and consider electric vehicles due to the really the low hanging fruit that EVs pose in terms of carbon reduction. Lastly, and maybe most importantly, is that large commercial fleet operators can make a solid business case to justify the investment in, in electric vehicles. EVs are projected to have up to 70% lower maintenance costs than traditional internal combustion engine vehicles, as well as overall lower operating costs, which potentially gives them a lower total lifetime cost of operations. For these reasons, it's our view that once we've reached this tipping point, fleets are poised to electrify rapidly and will likely overtake EV adoption rates of residential customers. Compounding this is because fleet's decisions to electrify could involve up from, from dozens to hundreds of vehicles that when fleets make that decision, it could result in, in really overnight growth of EVs in a utility service territory. For utilities, this puts, us, puts focus on the need to ensure 
the right infrastructure is in place to meet customer needs. Electrification of fleets is going to require utilities to develop really new models of customer engagement based on those needs, and really to to incorporate um, customer feedback on infrastructure and other types of costs. And so this engagement is going to be critical in the planning process, and we're going to speak to that as as we go on. Next slide. So I want to shift a little bit and talk about some of the ways in which fleets will differ than traditional CNI customers, and in fact, may constitute an entirely new class of electric customer. The first is, is simply just the potential size of fleet charging loads. And this is, this is true in particular for fleets of medium and heavy duty vehicles, which combine potentially large numbers of vehicles with also significant charging requirements in the multi megawatt range. To illustrate the scale of these new load requirements, it's helpful to compare fleet capacity with more traditional demand sources such as commercial buildings. In the graphic on the left, you can see how the type and number of chargers impacts the load requirement, as well as the step change between level two chargers seen in the middle and the right, and DCSC or fast chargers seen on the far left. To put this into perspective, the graphic on the right puts that load into terms typical of commercial uh, building load, which for this for these purposes we've we've calculated at 40 uh, kilowatts. At this rate, a small number of level two chargers equals about 14 commercial buildings, while 150 DCFC chargers would equal the same as approximately 234 buildings. This highlights one of the unique characteristics of fleet charging which is the geographic concentration of load at facilities such as garages and vehicle depots, and the impact that that concentrated load will have on the distribution system. Next slide. So not only will the size of potential loads be large, but when they will occur will deviate from traditional notions of CNI load profiles and are be driven by a different set of factors such as fleet operating cycles. In this example, we have a simplified load profile for a 50 vehicle heavy duty fleet with a typical daytime shift. At the conclusion of the shift, I'll start a little bit to the right, around 4 or 5 p.m., the trucks will return to the depot and perhaps after some maintenance or repositioning, they'll plug in to begin under charging for the next day. In this scenario, the fleet 50 vehicles requires 25 DCS heat chargers. We can serve two vehicles per charger. The charging cycle is about 12 hours, so you're getting about six hours to charge each vehicle. What we've done here also is, char is spread out the charge over as many of the hours as possible to minimize peak. As you can see, in the early AM hours, when it comes time for the trucks to run the next day, they're fully charged to their maximum operating capacity and spend the next nine hours or so discharging the batteries, which you see in the orange. In this scenario, there are two things that I really like to draw your attention to. The first is a nearly complete absence of charging load during the middle of the day when the fleets, the vehicles are out running the routes. And the second is the potential for a very steep ramp late in the day as the vehicles return and begin charging, even with a spread out load. Other fleet operating cycles, such as nighttime operations or multiple shifts, may have entirely different charging patterns, which may only serve to exacerbate the demands being placed on the grid. In addition, fleet operations are not static and may change over time such as weekends seasonally or even geographically so what we're left with here are very large customers with a highly variable dynamic loads that really and truly behave like unlike any other customers currently on the system next slide as i've described unlike traditional loads fleet operating and charging cycles will really determine this, both the, the sizes of the initial capital investments, but also ongoing charging expenses for fleets. Charging needs of a fleet will drive charger selection and charging time of day, which will in turn drive rates. Similarly, the, the, the size of the load will determine the electric system needs and potential upgrades which can drive those upfront infrastructure costs. What's important on this slide to realize, and if there's really, there's only one thing we take away from this discussion, I think is that as fleets begin to electrify, an opportunity exists for utilities to work with fleet customers to begin to adapt their operations and their charging cycles to minimize these costs. What's different here is that based on these estimates of the cost, those duty and charging cycles may be able to be modified. 
You may be able to change operations in a way that reduces infrastructure costs. As compared to traditional customers, utilities will, will need to engage fleets earlier in the planning process, maybe even before utilities receive firm load commitments. They'll need to begin to evaluate fleet's energy needs, explore managed charging options, help fleets understand charging costs, and plan for future proofing of infrastructure for long-term growth. In addition, utility planning timeframes and fleet electrification decision-making timeframes will not likely be aligned. By the time fleets uh, uh, approach utilities, they may have already made charger and vehicle decisions. Too late, really, to take advantage of some of the uh, opportunities to right-size right infrastructure. Each of these actions will serve to lower the cost of these investments, protecting utility customers, while also reducing barrier to fleet electrification. Next slide. And the final reason that I would argue fleets are unique types or unique type of electric customer is because of the rate structures that will likely need to be developed to serve specific fleet needs. As fleets convert to electricity from gasoline and diesel, they will be looking to the electric power industry to provide the fuel for fleet vehicles. Conventional fleets purchase fuel through either bulk contracts, which you can see on the left, which lock in fuel prices over a long period of time, or through fuel cards, which allow fleets to refuel along their routes at commercial refueling stations, gas stations, truck stops, et cetera. Fleets manage fuel costs through efficiency, such as driver behavior, route optimization, not by when they buy or, or how they refuel the vehicles. As opposed to electricity, gasoline and diesel are the same price generally, regardless of when a vehicle is refueled and are priced on, on a purely volumetric basis. Electric rates, on the other hand, vary based on customer class, time of day, and for most CNI customers, include a demand component in addition to a volumetric component. The industry is going to need, the electric industry will need to look for alternatives such as subscriptions, other mechanisms, clean peak pricing, et cetera, that are more closely aligned with the needs of fleets. This is an area where we think there's going to be a lot of development in the future and one I would encourage you all to look out for. Next slide. So to wrap up, I want to leave you with just a few thoughts. Because of their size, unique load profiles and rate structures, we may want to think about fleets as a unique class of electric customer. Approaches that have worked for other customer types just may not work for fleets. Also, fleet electrification presents really unique challenges to the electric industry. But for those utilities that embrace electrification, it's our view that fleets also represent a once in a generation opportunity to bring onto the electric system a whole new class of electric customer. Utility outreach and engagement with, with, with fleets is gonna be critical. Fleet managers are likely unfamiliar with system planning processes, electric rate structures, and will need guidance from utilities before making decisions in charging infrastructure and vehicles that may be suboptimal or drive overinvestment in the grid. And lastly, regulators we've seen in many places are beginning to see the importance of fleet electrification in addition to retail uh, residential customers. Many state, states have, have begun to put into place fleet electrification goals, medium and heavy duty goals, as well as mandating outreach and engagement programs for fleets. Managing these conversations with regulators through rate, create, rate cases and other proceedings is also going to be a very important part of this whole process. And with that, um, Kristen, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks very much. And if our other panelists could join us, we do have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, and we have had a number of questions rolling in. Um, so the first one I am going to send over to Josh. And let's, let's see. Um, so, Josh, in terms of the Massachusetts roadmap, um, did you evaluate where all the materials for solar, wind, batteries, and transmission lines is going to come from and at what cost? Great, great question. And, you know, costs are obviously a big concern. I think, first, to be very clear, the assumptions, the roadmap is developed by the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. So 
not Scott Madden's assumptions. You know, we're we're analyzing some of the things they put into it. Um, but is terms in terms of the roadmaps assumptions, there are so in the details of the reports, um, they definitely lay out where some of their assumptions came from for overall costs. So maybe not getting quite to the materials level in every case, but looking to NREL, DOE, and different models and reports and then modifying them based off cost to do business and siting in the region. So there, there are some assumptions there. I'm not sure in every case it gets down to the material level. Um, and then also we haven't seen the underlying model where there presumably are quite a bit more detail of how those assumptions work. So great question. And materials are obviously a concern for renewables, especially batteries, and just to get some of these things in the ground. And I'll, I'll add, since we're talking about costs, one more thing that makes these assumptions even more important, that when we look back at maybe that 2020 reference of things looking the same in 2050, first that all options approach and it being relatively this from the roadmaps assumptions, relatively the same cost, annual energy cost for the economy in 2050. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of differences in there where today there's a lot of fuel costs, whether it's natural gas or petroleum. Those variable costs shift over time to their assumptions of shift cost or fixed costs in the distribution and transmission system to move all that electricity, uh, charging infrastructure, some demand response and some of the dynamic things that need to go into the grid to accommodate everything. So while maybe in their assumption, the end result's not that different, the costs that build that up and the nature of them is very different. And you know, materials is a part of that for sure. Thanks, Josh. So we did have a couple of questions on the transmission side, um, and I'll actually field one and give some perspective there. There was a question on whether or not um, these line miles were being planned overhead or underground. And to start with, the, the vast, vast majority of transmission lines are overhead uh, across the country. And that's largely because of cost. Um, the cost to underground a transmission line is roughly 10 times what it takes to build it overhead. And typically overhead, you can estimate it about $2 million a mile, depending upon where you're building it underground could be 10 times that. So it's almost all overhead. Um, what typically drives transmission lines underground is local stakeholder protest. Um, there have been a number of notable examples. Chino Hills in California ended up being underground, significant um, project investment there. Bethel Norwalk years ago as part of um, Northeast Utilities transmission um, work in the mid to late 2000s. So again, there's some experience there, but most of it's overhead. Um, our question, so moving over to Kevin again. Um, so what types of fleets do you see electrifying first? How do you think the order of um, consumers is gonna move there? Yeah, I think, I think it's a really interesting question because the focus has been so much on passenger vehicles and, and, and residential customer adoption of EVs. Uh, but I really feel that uh, because of the reasons outlined um, before, we're going to see a lot more last mile delivery vehicles. And those can take the form of, of light duty passenger vehicles, um, but also think of things like florists who may do deliveries or service technicians that may be coming to homes. In addition to what I think is the real driver, um, Amazon, FedEx, UPS, and others that are uh, they're driving out there today, they're running routes, they're local, low mileage, and return to base every night. I think that'll really drive uh, those vehicle classes. Definitely. Um, so, Josh, if you had to pick what the single biggest technological advancement associated with the roadmap is, how would you characterize that, or, or would you? Yeah. So, maybe before I answer that, I will say two to the roadmap's credit, while it is you know, very ambitious, they don't really rely on a lot of breakthrough technologies in the sense that even grid scale storage doesn't play a big role in most of the pathways. There's no miracle carbon capture solution that hits in 2045 to make this work. Um, it, it's mostly focused on technologies that are at least tested and in place today. And But given that, I'd say probably the biggest piece or maybe the biggest challenge overall is really offshore wind, where there's, I mean, just a, a little bit now in Massachusetts, or I guess not um, in, in New England anyway, and that needs to ramp up 
dramatically in order to make kind of any of this work in the roadmap. So that's probably the biggest one. And then electrification in general of uh, buildings. And that's probably not so much technology, but execution of the conversion of all these from gas to uh, gas or petroleum to electric. Thanks for that. Um, so Farzeen, you had mentioned um, some of the challenges to getting interregional transmission developed. Can you elaborate on those a little bit? Sure. Um, so there's there's a there's several there's several barriers to entry here. Um, I'd say the first is something I mentioned, which was there's no national planning authority, uh, and so there's no group that can make decisions about where transmission lines. Uh, or these kinds of interregional transmission lines could be located. The second one is uh, jurisdiction for siting and for permitting. That still remains with the states. Uh, and in some cases, counties and, and cities also get to weigh in here. Uh, and then if the, the interregional transmission line crosses into federal land, then you have to deal with multiple federal agencies as well. And due to these variety of jurisdictions and with so many regions, you also have an additional number of stakeholders um, we can see a lot of uh, permitting issues that we'd run into there as well. And I'd say the third is, is the, the cost allocation of the, of the grid would be controversial because um, some, would be, some stakeholders would be seen as winners and others would be seen as losers based on the cost of the power, based on jobs to help build these lines, uh, access to renewables, things like that. So those are some of the, or three of, of the major barriers. Thank you. Um, in in that vein, we all, we had an, a question from the audience about is there a role for private investment in transmission? I'm assuming that means outside of the utility sector. And you know what I can say from having witnessed the transmission build out in the mid 2000s is that there was tremendous interest from outside the sector because we had ROEs that were approaching 14%. Um, the the question becomes where where do you invest? Do you buy a project? Do you buy, buy a company, et cetera? And I think the same question remains today. You know, there's lots of interest in transmission because it can be a very good model for rate recovery um, through formulaic rates and, and investment adders, but it's still extraordinarily hard to get built. Um, let's see. So we, it looks like we are just about at time. Um, PJ, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to you. Um, for anyone who is interested in downloading the energy industry update, the link has been provided in the chat. So please download it. You can read up on the topics that we covered here today and others. And thank you very much to our panelists. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, panel. Fantastic presentation. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. As you log off, please take a moment and complete our survey uh, and give us a little bit of your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you all for attending and this does conclude today's event.